That's why we get up. That's why we come. That's why we gather. That's why we give him our first. So this morning, um, as we begin, I believe that this uh, message, I believe that this particular season, beginning with last week, is really guided by the hand of God. Um, And then as we're singing this morning, Skylar didn't know what today's message uh, was, but the, the, the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. The implications of that, the, the vastness of that particular statement um, is going to be uh, present in today's message. But before I begin, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, you're loved by God. He loves you. You're his uh, children, your sons and your daughters, and he gave you brothers and sisters to navigate this life alongside And so today, part of our navigation through life that we need to recognize, we need to accept and step into is sharing some of the pain, sharing some of the suffering that we're walking through so that others around us recognize we're not alone. We're not alone in the journey. We're not alone in the hardship. We're not alone in the difficulty. I've had many conversations with people lately. Oftentimes, we can get kind of stuck in a, a cycle or a routine, really just proclaiming all of the good things and all of the victories in life. And some people can get the impression that everything is just perfect in other people's world. But I'm here to tell you we have a Bible packed full of people who didn't have it all together, who suffered much, who endured much, who grieved much. And so we are uh, not alone in our journey of difficulties. We're not alone in the valleys. We don't have to just cry out from the mountaintops when things are well, but we can cry out from the valleys to let people know, this is what I'm walking through, and I need someone on this journey. So open your hearts, I pray this morning, to others. Open your hearts to others. You have a family. He's given you brothers and sisters for that particular journey. Receive it as a good gift from the Father. This morning, my aim for our time together is to renew a hunger and thirst within us. Or maybe not renew a hunger and thirst, but maybe redirect it. Because the reality is the hunger and the thirst always exists. It just matters as to where it's being directed. And so in this season, I want God to reveal in us areas that we might have grown complacent or areas that we might have grown disillusioned with what it means to follow Jesus. I want us to seek and find the richness and completeness received in following Jesus, as I spoke of last week with the fullness of life. If you recall that message, if you weren't here, really quick recap. I shared in a message that I believe is important uh, for this moment of not just even our church, but the church. And the emphasis of that message was that the majority of believers, I believe, and that I witness, that I observe, the majority of believers are stuck in the middle of John 10.10, 10, where Jesus says, I have come that you may have life, period, right? I've come that you may have life. We sing songs, we uh, share messages, we, when people ask us, what is it that Jesus did? He died for my sins. He did do that. He did come to do that. But verse 10 continues on, doesn't it? I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. The reality is that almost everyone in this room, probably everyone in this room, has received new life the new life that Jesus came to bring. But so many of us, so many believers, end up living as though there's a period after Jesus says, I've come that you might have new life. But the passage continues. He says that he came to give us life to the full, or some translations put it abundant life, a more uh, a recent version that or translation that I found that I love the way it puts it. It says, life in all its fullness. 
What I love about that translation, life in all its fullness, is this. Jesus' invitation is about whole life. Life in all its fullness. It's about whole life. No voids, no emptiness, only fullness. Imagine being whole from the inside. All the voids, all of what feels like it's missing or longing, but being full completely. That's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm interested in for myself. That's what I'm interested in for every single person in this room. That's what I'm interested in for the body of Christ or anyone who would come be part of Life Community Church and walk in this particular ministry. I have received new life. Now I want to seek the fullness of life. Is anyone else on that page? Is anyone else, as I shared last week, feel like something's missing? There's still something. There's still a void. I've been, maybe I've been following Jesus for a really long time, but why does it still, this life feels just a little bit meaningless. It feels like it lacks a little bit of purpose. It really just feels like the mundane day after day after day. What is the real purpose? What is the real meaning? I want, and I think the majority of people want, to live a life full of meaning and purpose. Satisfaction at the deepest level of our being. That's what dictates our lives. We're searching for satisfaction. We're searching for satisfaction. We're searching for peace. It is dictating our lives completely. The hunger and the thirst exists. It just needs to be redirected. So I want meaning, purpose, satisfaction. I also want in my own life healing from deep wounds of the past. Does anyone else need healing from deep wounds? How you've been hurt, whether it's harboring unforgiveness. The reason I mentioned that many times last week and this week is I find that to be a common thing in the hearts of people, harboring unforgiveness. Do we want healing from that? I want, so I want healing from deep wounds of the past, but I also want this life with Jesus to build in me a resilience to the wounds that are coming. Because that's the reality, is there's more to come. I want a heart, I want a being prepared for the wounds of the future. And then also I want a deep wellspring of life to offer others. How many of you, you barely feel like you've got enough for yourself? All I've got in the tank is reserved just for me, much less do I have anything, do I have anything left to give to anyone else. But this life wasn't just about us. We know that. Any of us have been in church, and many of us in this room have been in church for a long time. We know this life is not just about us, but the majority of us barely have the energy for ourselves. We barely have the motivation. We barely have the depth of life to just wake up, go along each day with that kind of confidence, with that kind of mindset, right? But the reality is that being formed in the image of Christ is for God's glory and is for the good of others. So this life isn't just about improvement of oneself. The full life isn't about just for me. The full life is about what I can actually be able to then give to others, give to the body of Christ. So some questions that I think we should consider before we get into this any further this morning. These questions I think that are important to consider this. Is the way that as, as in regards with, with thinking of other people in our lives, thinking of other people we influence, thinking of other people under our care, consider these questions. Is the way that I'm being formed for the spiritual good of those around me? Is the way that I'm being formed, is the way that I'm being shaped for the spiritual good, for the life-giving spirit of God in others' lives? And then another question for us to consider as we think about fullness, as we think about what, uh, if we're experiencing the fullness of life, is this. Is the life that I'm experiencing something that I want others to experience? 
If you think about your life with Jesus right now and the deep satisfaction that you're receiving from that life, is it something that you say, other people need this? Do you feel that that's what it is for your life? I believe that many of us would agree that either one, we're not quite there yet, Or at least, two, we have room for growth. We have room to expand. Because there's oftentimes when I'm in different seasons and different times where I'm like, do I want people to to follow the way of Jesus? Is this where where life really is? Is where I'm sensing and experiencing the fullness of life? I've been there many times in my journey. But the problem is, as I pointed out last week, The problem is, is that this is not achieved by hearing this message today. It's not achieved by deciding that it's what I want for my life. It begins with that decision. I have decided to follow Jesus. So it begins with a decision, but it's achieved with new ways of living. It's being convinced that I was created for something far greater far more significant, far more important, far more satisfying than living the mundane highs and lows that this life has to offer. It's trusting that God can truly be my delight, that my joy can truly come just from Him. It's believing Jesus' words when He said that he came to give me life to the full. Do you believe those words this morning? He came to give you life and life to the full. And all of this begins. This life, this pursuit, once we've made this decision, all begins with being with Jesus. That's where life in all of its fullness is found. And being with Jesus is what a disciple does. It's a word we're going to hear a lot this morning. It's what a disciple does. And if you're a believer in this room today, you are a disciple. Whatever the message you heard or understood upon becoming a believer, the decision you made was to lay down your life and follow Jesus as his Disciple. You made the decision found in Mark 8, 34 and 35. He says, Then he called to the crowd. So then he called the crowd to him, along with his many disciples, and says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. This is the decision we made when we said, I will follow Jesus. The problem is this. The word disciple is a little foreign to us. It's a little foreign to 21st century believers. You see, the most common label today used by believers is Christian, right? I'm a Christian, not disciple. We don't walk around saying, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm a Christian, which isn't a bad thing, but it loses some meaning when translated to just Christian in accordance with what the New Testament teaches about being a disciple of Jesus. And the truth is, is that the word Christian, if you didn't know this, if you did know this, is only used three times throughout the New Testament. This word is found three times in the New Testament. In comparison, the word disciple is used 269 times in the New Testament. And Christian was originally used to mock followers of Jesus before eventually becoming a term that was embraced by those who were devoted to following him. This was used to mock followers of Jesus. Here's why I'm emphasizing this particular point. Being identified as a Christian isn't a bad thing. 
It's not a bad thing, but it does run the risk of losing what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And those being called Christians, we should make note of this, those being called Christians, which actually means little Christ, means little Christ. So those being called little Christ in the first century church were being called that because they were imitating Christ. That's why they were being called that. It wasn't a name that they gave themselves. It was unbelievers calling them little Christs because of the lives that they were living. Which makes me wonder, what might people call me today? Would someone call me a little little Christ today? If people observe the way that I live, the way that I talk, the way that I treat others, would they call me a little Christ? Would I be mocked by unbelievers, being called an imitator of Christ? You see, one of the issues of our day is that self-identifying as a Christian doesn't mean a lot. If you've been around for very long and you've heard plenty of people proclaim to be Christian, right? Have you ever heard someone proclaim to be a Christian that you really maybe questioned whether or not they were a Christian or not. Obviously, none of us in the room know someone's heart. But have you ever just wondered, I don't, I'm not so sure about that person. So it looks like many different things. It doesn't mean a lot, but it also looks like many different things to many different people, which creates a problem. For example, a Pew Research survey from a few years ago, I think it was 2021, found that around 63% of Americans self-identify as Christians, a number that's in slow decline. But in a few years ago, it was around 63% self-identify as Christian. But then some additional survey work was performed, um, and something that's really hard to pinpoint, but they did their due diligence to try to achieve uh, uh, as accurate results as they could. They were attempting to measure those actively following Jesus. So in comparison, those who self-identify, those who are actually actively following Jesus. And that number came out uh, in this particular survey at 4%. So those claiming to be Christian was around 63%, and those living as disciples of Jesus Uh, was at 4%. And so the problem that's been created is a culture where you can be a Christian but not be a disciple of Jesus. A distinction between being a Christian and being a disciple of Jesus. But the problem is that the Scriptures draw no distinction between these two groups of people. That being said, I think we need to clarify then. What does a disciple do? How would we know what a disciple looks like? How would we know what this looks like in in our mind? Because it's not a term we use. When's the last time you used the word disciple in just your normal language? Not very often. The best modern comparison that I've heard come from other people far smarter than I am uh, that they use is the word apprentice the word apprentice, someone who is following a master of a trade to intimately learn how something is done, to listen to their words, to watch the way they perform their trade or discipline, and then to do that trade themselves. We hear this term uh, like in, I think, plumbing and electrical work. There's an apprentice who's an understudy for a master in that particular trade. But even with this definition, even with looking at it in our particular, uh, you know, cultural lens, uh, even with that, what a disciple is goes even deeper than that modern understanding of an apprentice. I think it's helpful for us then to look at how the earliest Jews would have understood this concept, how they would have understood what it actually meant to be a disciple. And so I think this particular information helps us get there. Let's, I'll just briefly go over it because it can get really nerdy really fast if you want to go ever study it, but I won't um, do that with you this morning. 
But here's how this would go in this particular culture. Jewish kids would have started school around the age of five with their curriculum being the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. By the age of 12 or 13, most kids would have the Torah memorized. Mem memorized. I don't have the first five books of the Bible memorized. I I'll just confess today, and maybe nobody else in the room does either. So by the age of 12 or 13, most would have the Torah memorized. And at that point, most students would return home and apprentice or learn the family trade, whatever that was. But the best students would go on to a second level of education where they would continue in their studies, and by the age of 17, they would have the entire Old Testament memorized. The entire Old Testament memorized. At this point, the majority of these students were finished in their studies and they would remain home and work in their family trade. But the best of the best students would get an opportunity at that point to apply to be an apprentice or a disciple under a rabbi from whom they desired to learn, who they desired to apprentice or study under. You see, it's important to understand, whether you've heard this or not, whether I've shared this, it's been years ago, but this concept of what Jesus was doing, going around selecting these disciples, this wasn't completely unique. This was a practice within this culture. He wasn't the only rabbi selecting disciples in this period of time. And so these students, these best of the best of the best students who now had the Old Testament memorized, uh, they would then apply to an apprentice, someone that they wanted to learn from, someone that they, the language is used with, someone they wanted to take on that rabbi's yoke, their set of ways and teachings. And so they would apply under this rabbi. And then after a rigorous assessment, if the rabbi thought that you had what it would take, he might give you some invitation similar to words we've heard from Jesus, something like, come follow me. Come learn under me. Then, at that point, the aim of your life, if you were selected to go apprentice under this rabbi, the aim of your life could be summed up in three different kind of ideas. The first being this, to be with your rabbi, to remain with him. Not just This wasn't just like eight to five, Monday through Friday. This wasn't weekends off. This wasn't just on Sundays. This was all day, every day, by the side of your rabbi, walking where he walked, listening to his words, observing all that he did. Then the second, so the first is to be with your rabbi. The second was to, would be to become like your rabbi. The heart behind this apprenticeship or discipleship was to be with the master for the purpose of becoming like the master. The goal was to emulate him, to sound like him, to act like him in every way possible to be like this rabbi. This is why these uh, Christians, these early believers, these early followers of Jesus were being called little Christs. Why? They looked like him. They talked like him. They walked like him. They lived like him. They were Christians. So first, to be with your rabbi. Second, become like your rabbi. Then finally, to do what your rabbi did. To do what your rabbi did. The reason for training as under training under a rabbi was to become a rabbi to reach a point at one day where the rabbi releases you and says go and make disciples yourself you are now trained you are now ready go make disciples this is what it meant to be a disciple this is what it meant to apprentice under a rabbi this is still what it means to be a disciple today. 
It might look a little bit different in the natural, but this is still what it means. And this is why, as I just mentioned, this is why first century believers were being called Christians by mockers. They looked like their rabbi. They looked like little Christ. So now, after that brief little um, historical moment, we are unified in our understanding of what it means to be a disciple. We've deepened our understanding of what a disciple looked like. But obviously, being a disciple in 21st century America looks different than that, does it not? We don't have Jesus here to actively uh, follow around. I uh, recognize that. So the question is, where, where do we begin? Where do we begin? I believe a good starting place for us is Jesus' invitation to his first disciples in Matthew chapter 4. This is where we're going to be for just a little while this morning. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Verse 20, At once they left their nets and followed him. Let's pray for just a moment. Father God, open our hearts this morning to hear from you. I ask that your spirit would illuminate new truth to us, would challenge us, would encourage us, would convict us if necessary, Lord, that we may be formed, that we may be shaped, that we may be stirred up today as followers of Jesus. I pray that these words be born of your spirit, not of my flesh, Lord. For I desire a full body of Christ, Lord. I desire full believers experiencing the fullest life that you have available to us. Do that work this morning. Start that work this morning. Continue that work this morning in the lives of your people, I pray. Amen. Amen. So here we have a rabbi, Jesus, offering an invitation with these three important words, come, follow me. The same words that are extended to you and I today, the same words that were extended to you uh, before you became a follower of Jesus, come, follow me. But before we get to respond to this invitation, as we see in the, with these disciples, the first step for those desiring to become a disciple of Jesus, the first step is found in verse 20. At once, they left their nets and followed him. At once, they left their nets and followed him. This is a, a symbolic gesture of leaving an old life behind, an old way of living, an old purpose of living and Jesus made this clear in Mark 8. He says in Mark 8, verses 34 and 35, Then he called to the crowd, then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples. He says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Laying down an old life to come follow Jesus. Then the next step after laying down these nets and responding to this invitation of Jesus, the rabbi, the next step is accepting the invitation. Come, follow me. Notice this first instruction wasn't go and do anything. It wasn't go out and work and go out and do. It first was, come follow me. Come follow me. Come follow my ways. Much of following Jesus today can often look like learning the right and wrong things to believe, the right and wrong ways to behave. But what ancient discipleship teaches us is that it's much more than that. To follow Jesus meant walking alongside him. 
It meant learning. It meant observing. It meant obeying. It meant imitating Jesus. It meant not leaving the presence of the Lord, but instead doing everything in one's power to remain with him, to be with him always, for him to be on our minds, for his words to be on our lips, for his comforting presence to always be near. This was following Jesus. And there's something to this type of invitation from him. There's something to this throughout the scriptures from Jesus. Jesus has this recurring invitation to others that is this, uh, can be summed up as, come to me. Come follow me, he says in Matthew 4. Come and see, he says in John 1 to the disciples, asking where he's staying. Come and drink to all who thirst in John 7. Come and have breakfast in John 21. Come to me all who are weary and burdened and find rest in Matthew 11. Come, you blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom. Matthew 25. You see, coming to Jesus, following Jesus, Remaining with Jesus is the key. It's the key to life. It's the key to fullness of life. But how often, if you just examine your own daily life, your own daily routine, as I examine my own, how often in our daily routines is Jesus absent? How often are we distracted by life that we forget the one who came to give us life? Or possibly do we even think that we need to be disciples? As I mentioned earlier, there seems to be this divide created where you can be a Christian without being a disciple. This is a problem facing much of the church today, is that being a disciple or following Jesus is largely viewed or even presented in some instances as something that's optional or something that someone chooses to participate in after they've been saved or as if it's like a a deeper track for people who want to go further with God. But the gospel writings reveal this. Time and time again, they reveal two recurring groups of people. They reference disciples and crowds. We hear of the disciples and we hear of the crowds. You have followers of Jesus and then you have everyone else. This is the distinction drawn time and time again. There isn't a reference to a, a third group of people called Christians who mostly agree with his teachings but have not oriented their lives around following him, around being with him. This is how Dallas Willard frames this issue in his book, The Great Omission. He says this, The greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians will become disciples students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of the heavens into every corner of human existence. Can you imagine for just a moment if all of the professing Christians around the world would become disciples of Jesus, true followers of of Jesus, approaching all of life as Jesus would approach all of life. Can you imagine? I often frame it that way. This way in living in which how would Jesus steward my life? If he were living my life, if he were walking my daily routine, my daily rhythms, how would he treat my family? How would he spend my money? What would he do with my body? This is the formation into Christ's image. 
Can you imagine if we transitioned from uh, a, a goal of just trying to get people saved into the goal of trying to get people to follow Jesus, to be with him, to remain with him, to be formed by him? Because there's a difference. There's a significant difference, and a difference that will absolutely change your life. Because the reality is there may be some of us in this room who aren't following Jesus. We profess to be Christians, but maybe we're not following Jesus like we could be. Maybe we are following Jesus, but to the degree it's not wholehearted, it's not fully committed. Because that's where fullness of life That's what I talked about last week. That's what I was emphasizing last week is how do we experience the full life that God has for each and every one of us? It's found first. Our first step is being with Jesus, following him, walking in his ways, remaining near to him, listening to him, observing him, watching him walk, watching him, how he treated people. Obviously, we're not here following him in the physical. That's why the word of God is so important. The life of Jesus is so important. Because there is a difference. There is a difference between being a Christian and being a follower of Jesus. At least in today's culture, there's a distinction between the two. So church, Jesus' instructions to his disciples, come and follow me this invitation that he gave, shouldn't be written off as, well, that was for them since they were with Jesus. They were, well, he was there with them. They were here, they were there following this rabbi. Our greatest need as a church, and I I fight this uh, uh, just dilemma on a regular basis where I'm deliberating, how do we do this? The greatest need for us is to figure out and discover what does it look like to follow Jesus in our world right now? What does that look like for us? That's going to look different for every person in this room to some degree. We all have different lives. We all have different things going on. But discovering what that looks like in each one of our lives is the next greatest need right in front of us. How do I more uh, intently, how do I more uh, intimately follow Jesus? And not to the degree that we feel is okay, not to the degree that we're comfortable with, not to the degree that's convenient for us, but to the degree that brings about Christ-like imitation, to where our natural reflexes and impulses resemble that of Christ-likeness. The example I use there so often is this. Because the majority of the time, we, we hear this a lot in church, when, when you're under pressure, when you get in a moment of anger, how do you respond is the question. Oftentimes, the majority of us in this room, we know how to respond, do we not? We know how we should respond in that moment. But when that moment of pressure hits, the fruit that's in us is actually what bears itself. And so without the the time and the commitment put to produce the right kind of fruit in the moment of that particular season, that particular sliver of time, if the work's not been put in, the fruit's not going to be present. So when I hear the words natural impulses, natural reflexes, is what's the momentary response in that time? Is that the fruit of Christ or is it the fruit of my flesh? So Christ-like imitation, being with him to the degree that we are formed like him, that our natural responses, our natural impulses resemble that of Christ. Also, to where we would actually be called little Christ by unlocking mockers. That should be a goal of ours. Unbelievers looking at us, thinking, They don't know what Christian actually means, I guess, in in that particular sense. But a way in which we're living that looks so much like Christ that might bother some people. Not that I want to be, you know, a bother. 
So to where our natural reflexes and impulses resemble that of Christ-likeness, to where we would be called little Christ by onlooking mockers, to where John 13, 35 says we will be known as disciples by the love that we have for one another. This is how we'll be known as his disciples. This is where fullness of life is discovered, church. This is where it is laying down our lives, taking up our cross, and following Jesus, living as God intended us to live, experiencing the fullness of our created design. Only the Creator knows how we are completely fulfilled and we are completely satisfied. Trusting His plan for that, trusting His way for that is what's necessary for each and every one of us. In the coming weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at new rhythms of life that help us. Like I said, it's not enough to just hear this message and go home and think, I've changed. But actually have to take some steps towards doing this. Some steps towards making my life, shaping my life, orienting uh, my daily routine in a way that I can remain with Jesus. What does it look like for me to be a modern-day follower of Jesus? So we're going to be looking at new rhythms of life that help us remain with him hour by hour, day by day. Because remaining in him and being formed in his image will not happen by accident. We'll be being formed in some way or fashion. It's not going to happen by accident. William Paul Sell says this. He says, It's unlikely that we will deepen our relationship with God in a casual or haphazard manner. There will be a need for some intentional commitment and some reorganization in our own lives. But there is nothing that will enrich our lives more than a deeper and clearer perception of God's presence in the routine of daily living. The reality is he's near us, he's with us, he's always working. We're either blind to that or we're distracted by it, but he's here and he's with us at every moment. He's working. And so to be a disciple is to say that I'm following Jesus in the routine of my daily living. I'm with him. I'm with him at work. I'm with him around the dinner table. I'm with him on my commute. I'm always with him. You see, I'm not saying that disciple, discipleship has a, a perfect three-step program. It's not, it doesn't look perfect. It doesn't look just like this. This is exactly how it's going to happen. You just do this, and you just do that, and you do this. But there is truth to the fact that it has a progression. And without a doubt, that progression begins with a life spent with Jesus, being with him, his words on my heart, his words in my mouth, my uh, awareness of his presence with me at all times. This is where it begins, and that invitation is open to all, seen in very clearly in today's text. One thing that really stood out to me in this study was this. Why did these men so quickly respond. Have you ever thought about that? Here Jesus walks along, they drop their nets, and they just go. Seems a little odd. We we look at it today and think, well, yeah, because it's Jesus. They didn't know that, right? Why did this happen? Here was this rabbi they didn't know was Jesus, inviting them to come and follow him, which as I just shared earlier, this would have been a special invitation, right? for a disciple to be chosen by a rabbi, to to come and follow, to come take on his yoke, learn from him. This would have been a special honor. But the reality is this. Since these men were here fishing, out doing the trade of their family, apparently meant that they didn't have what it took to be apprentices of a rabbi. They had returned to the family trade. Apparently, they had not been chosen to uh, follow uh, a rabbi. Because if you recall earlier, what was it? The top students, the top of the top, they got an opportunity to apply and to go study under a rabbi. But here were these guys 
fishing. What a beautiful symbol here for us today. Jesus' invitation to come follow him isn't meant for some special group of people. It wasn't for the top-tier students in this educational system. It's not for the academic elite. It's not for those of nobility. It's not for those who are, have a certain skill set. It's an invitation to the rich, the poor, the black, the white, the oppressed, the intelligent, the average. It's an invitation to every person in this room. Come follow me. And if you've not accepted the invitation to follow Jesus, now is your moment. Now is your time. If you're watching on Facebook, if you're in this room, this is your time. If you are a believer, but maybe you're not following Jesus by the power of the Spirit today, hopefully not my own words, but by the power of the Spirit, you feel a level of conviction to say, I actually, my daily routine uh, is pretty void of Jesus, whether that's just my attentiveness and awareness to, to him being with me and being aware of any moment that he's guiding me in any direction or any way or being open to any conversation and being willing to be interrupted, big part of following Jesus and aware of his presence in my life is a willingness to be interrupted. This is what I have to achieve. This is what's on the schedule. This is what is the plan. And when I'm not aware of Jesus' presence, I'll miss all kinds of opportunities that he may have orchestrated in those particular times and moments. But being aware to his presence says that this person right here in front of me at this very moment is the most important thing that God has for me right now. Why? Because I'm attentive to the presence of God. That's why every person in this room right now you're the most important people in front of me right now at this very moment. Because the Spirit of God is here. And He's guiding and He's directed. And today He saw to it that you were sitting in this room at this particular time hearing this very message. Why? Because He knows that you needed it. He knows that we needed it in this room today. And so if you feel a level of uh, concern as to your uh, level of following Jesus, your level of commitment to following Jesus, I'm asking you this morning to commit yourself to doing so. To say, I want to I remain with Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. I want to live my life aware of his presence, in his presence, in his word. I want his word in me. And I want you to join us over the coming weeks and months as we begin to start digging into a new life spent with Jesus. What might it look like for me to live my life spending more time, making more consecrated time to him, but then also not just so much, I believe, of, 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 a, of, a, of a problem we can have in our uh, Christian life is trying to just completely separate these, compartmentalize these areas of life. This is my time with Jesus over here. This is the rest of my time over here. We need consecrated, dedicated times with him, without a doubt. But he's also present in the rest of life. He's also present when I get to work. He's present when I'm on a Zoom call, when I'm in a meeting, when I'm wherever I'm going. If it's a, a, a ball field, a basketball game, he is present. This is what I believe when Paul talks about uh, pray without ceasing. This isn't a constant walking around and talking to Jesus all of the time because nobody in this room can do that. It can't happen. So praying without ceasing, it has to do with an attentiveness to the fact that God is with me. He's ever-present in every single moment. What is he revealing to me as I walk in this moment, as I stand in this moment, as I have this conversation? He is present. So I want you to join with me. I want you to commit yourself to doing this. If not, that's, that's fine too. Continue on the journey on the, at the place that you're at. That's the reality of, of church life. You always have people across the spectrum of the journey. 
You have people just starting out. You have people digging deeper. I heard a pastor recently compare it to this. He said, it's like a swimming pool, the church is. The majority of the people are in the shallow end. A few people are in the deep end. And the few people in the deep end are trying to invite people to come down to the deep end out of the shallow end. But the reality is this, everybody's in the pool. We're all still in the pool. There's just some trying to draw people in. Come get into the deep end. Come pursue the fullness of life. Life to its full, complete life that God has for us. And so that's my invitation for you today. It's just to commit your hearts, plan today to prepare for that season. where We're going to dive into some deeper practices, some deeper rhythms, some, some uh, deeper moments and awareness uh, times spent in the presence of God through our lives as a body, as individuals, because I think it will transform our, our lives, it will transform our families, and it will transform our church. And when it does that, when it does that, the community around us doesn't stand a chance. If this body commits itself to following Jesus in that kind of way, the community around us doesn't stand a chance. Darkness doesn't stand a chance. All, that, all of the evil that wages war around us does not stand a chance when a body makes that step, makes that commitment. Amen? I want that for our church. I want that for each and every person in this room today. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father God, we are thankful for your word today. I pray that we've been stirred up by the power of your spirit. I pray that we've been revealed areas where we could, uh, where we could, where we've made the statement, I have decided to follow Jesus but maybe we're not following him quite like we should be. So thank you for revealing that to us today, if that's what's been revealed to us. Because now we have the opportunity to respond, to commit ourselves to being with Jesus, to remaining with him, to abiding in Christ. Teach us today, Lord. Help redirect our hunger and our thirst this morning. Our appetite that is within the soul, Lord. Help reveal that path to fullness. I ask for full lives in, in this place. I, I want you to, to create a deeper, a broader uh, imagination for the people of God that there's more that fulfills than what we think. We trust you this morning. We trust that you are the way of life and the way of life to the fullest, Lord. Help us to discipline ourselves in those ways. Reveal to us each and every moment, each and every day, Lord, the path to life, the path to fullness, Father. We want to walk in your ways. We want to know your voice. We want to see your hand at work that we might participate in your plan. It's the great gift you've given to us. We want to be part of what you're doing, Lord. Why? Because we are with you for all of eternity. We anticipate your return. We anticipate the age to come, Lord. And so today we work diligently as your people, ready and willing to serve and to love you. Change us this morning. Begin the work in us this morning, I pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, if you have, as we, before we close, if you have any prayer needs, you have something that you would like for someone to pray with you over, 